All right, you rock radio with America's station. There waves your sweet daddy on the radio, getting ready to entertain you with all the top hits around the globe. That's the kind of delivery that people came to expect from the extremely popular WKZQ radio back in the 1970s and 80s. It's the delivery of Gary Dawson, better known as the Freakin' Deacon. Thank you so much for listening. And of course, our folks right here in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, the almighty Grand Strand here. Deacon is behind the microphone at Q Rock Radio in Myrtle Beach. It's a refuge of sorts for him and others who were on-air personalities back when WKZQ Radio was one of the best known small market stations in the country. When my old buds got together and said, hey, what do you think about us doing our own shows again on the internet? and we'll kind of style it uh, from the old Rock 102. I said, man, I'm ready to go. Let's get her down. That idea emerged when jocks hey, from the old WKZQ gathered in Myrtle Beach for a reunion a couple of years ago. Radio had left many of them behind. Corporate influence shortened playlists and cut the number of on-air personalities. Syndicated hosts in one location were used on broadcasts in many different markets. When the 90s came, or actually the late 80s, a lot of broadcasters got the idea, you know, what we don't play can't hurt us. They were afraid that more people would turn off the radio station because they heard a record they didn't like than wait for a record they did like. And that's when I think radio started kind of falling apart. Q Rock, oh, I'm sorry, did I just say that? Numerous oh, individuals were left with no place to practice their craft, including many of those who had made WKZQ such an audience favorite. I always had that little, I don't know, that little guy in the back of my head that said, man, you're not finished yet. With that as the backdrop, some of the former jocks decided they would take their talents to the internet, and Q Rock Radio hit the digital airwaves. Us old guys who are still alive and vibrant and ready to rock and roll said, hey, we found us an outlet again. They decided to do radio like they did years before. The feeling was that if it worked once, it would work again. The basic tenet was we're going to have fun on the radio. We're going to play music that people like. We don't care if the music charts. We don't care if it ever sells a single copy. As long as people laying out on the beach love hearing it and people driving in their cars down the boulevard love hearing it, we're going to play it. What has emerged is an outlet that is an almost unlimited playlist and combines that with humor and personality, which had already proven to be a successful combination. When we get the responses from listeners that say, oh man, I remember dancing at the after deck when you played that song, or I remember being on the boulevard when you played that song. We know we're capturing it with the listeners. If you can grab their attention, hold on to it, you play their favorite music, you get out there in the public with them and uh, show them a good time, throw a good, well, maybe a couple of crummy jokes at them here and there, they like that. The Freakin' Deacon, Q-Rock Radio. It sounds much the same as it did way back when. Time to turn, so you won't burn. We actually went back and chose the jingle packages, two of the jingle packages that were used between 1975 and 1980. Q-Rock Radio has contributors in Minneapolis. John Van Pelt handles the midday shift from Raleigh, and there is the studio in Myrtle Beach. Being outside of Myrtle Beach makes us want to be there more, so that helps us relate with the fact that people are all over the United States that want to come down to the Grand Strand. We feel the same way they do. People are dialing up Q-Rock Radio on their computers. I think the response has been phenomenal. We've had listeners in all 50 states, uh, every continent we can prove except Antarctica. We're not sure, but there's probably some Army people listening in Antarctica. We thought adoption uh, would be slow. It actually turned out to be faster than we thought it was going to be. The question is whether there are enough people listening in order to turn a profit with the venture. No, absolutely not. Have you got any? <laughs> Time Warner want to buy some ads? <laughs> To be fair, the station did not begin at a really good time for any sort of advertising-supported endeavor. I think our biggest challenge has been just to persevere and to be able to come out of uh, the current economic uh, status of the country and have something, have a product that people will like. All right, ain't nothing to it. A baby can do it. Just hold it up to it. It's just for now, the staff will continue to offer sound that was absent for a while. Making money would be nice, and maybe that will happen in the years ahead, but for now, most involved are content with making their audience happy. And it's the people that come back to us and say, hey, man, I heard you all back in 1978, or I heard Deacon in 1985, or, you know, and, and, and say, you know, you all touched me when you did this or that, and I remember and I appreciate it. And there's the element of making themselves happy, too, and not having to rely on someone else to give them a spot behind the mic. You can't just be retired anymore, you know. It's, if you want to get back into it, uh, you don't have some corporate guy saying, hey, you're too old, you ain't hip enough. 
You're out of here, baby.